Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to this In Conversation pre-show event for Mrs. Pat. Uh, we're really delighted to have both the playwright and the director for this conversation. So please do welcome to the stage uh, Anton Berg and Alan Strachan. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm Alan Strachan, and this is Anton Burge. Uh, he wrote the play, uh, and I've directed the play. So this is not our normal place. We're normally out there. Yes. Uh, and I'm very sorry that um, you can't be uh, uh, privileged to have Penny Keith here as well, but she needs a bit of a rest after having done it this afternoon and having to do it again this evening, because it's only her, and uh, it's quite a long learn for one person. I'd quite like to be in there at the moment, actually. <laughs> You don't leave me on my own. <laughs> so maybe we should just kick off by um, just talking a bit about how the play came about. Um, Anton and I uh, worked together on a previous play by, by Anton about two years ago, which was another play about uh, a fairly well-known woman. Uh, in that case, it was Constance Spry, whose life turned out to be somewhat more... Uh, colourful, shall we say, uh, than some people might think. Um, we enjoyed doing that play very much, and uh, the play really came about as a result of working together on that, although it was written before. So I should really perhaps let Anton explain when and how he wrote the play and how it came to be here. Well, it's, it's, it's very strange doing this, because it feels as if I'm revisiting it, because I wrote it such a long time ago. It was the first thing... I wrote, so I do sit here in the audience thinking, oh God, I can't believe I actually wrote certain bits of it. <laughs> but I did. Uh, so I wrote it probably about 12, 13 years ago, and it just never happened. It was a bit like having an agoraphobic child. It never sort of wanted to leave the house. Um, and then we worked together and we talked about it, and uh, it sort of came about because of that. But really, it only happened because of you and also Penny if it hadn't been for the two of you wanting to do it and being passionate about it because she is, um, well, sort of a bit forgotten about now, unfortunately. Mrs she, Patrick Campbell, yes. yes, I think it's true to say, not perhaps totally forgotten. And no, she says herself in the play that she will only be remembered as a footnote to the career and the work of Bernard Shaw. And I suppose if she is remembered, it's very much because of that. Although there is another play about her. Some of you may have seen it. It's a, a play put together by a, an ex-actor called Jerome Kilty, an American who's now dead, uh, and he wrote a play called Dear Liar, which was compiled from the very extensive correspondence between Mrs. Patrick Campbell and Shaw. Uh, she was a wonderful letter writer. She had a great gift for putting her thoughts down on the page, and of course he was no mean slouch himself. So the, the letters do make a fascinating parallel pair of biographies um, and that play is very very different from this one and I suppose it's not often done dear liar so um, you're probably right in saying that she's now a sort of minor figure. Well I didn't want to I mean most of the work I do is is female led or about women I mean we had a bloke didn't we in Storm and a Flower Fast, but I don't think it was a very good part but he was he was nice to have done it um, but yes I didn't want to write about Shaw at all I just wanted to focus on her and I thought I mean, writing a play for the first time, I wanted to do a monologue, which aren't very popular because they're difficult to do because people don't want to do them. This is why Penny's the bravest woman in the world, really, actually, going out here every night and doing a one-person show. Um, and I thought, well, if I could try and encompass somebody's life in a moment in their time, in a sort of limbo time, um, then I might be able to manage it. But my focus was on her and that dilemma of a female in that predicament, an older woman, um, at that time, and just sort of shine a light on her life, really. I mean, the main reason my interest in her grew because of working in the theatre um, when I was much younger as an actor and various other jobs that I had in, in costume and whatever, and just... First of all, somebody told her... Because everybody used to tell Mrs. Pat stories, didn't they? Other actors. Didn't Other they? actors yeah. who had either seen her or had worked with her. 
um, told these funny stories and she made me laugh. And as a sort of 17, 18 year old, I thought, oh my God, this is outrageous. This is sort of good material. And then I began reading about her and then thought she would be an interesting subject. And she certainly is. Um, does anybody uh, who knows her life and knows her background, has anybody who has that knowledge actually seen the play yet? Or yes, because some people might have. I don't know. You've seen it and you came back. And did you know, so anyth- nice. and did you know anything about her? No, no, I didn't. Know. Anyone who's going to see it tonight has got a real treat. Oh, good. Store. Good, good. I mean, when, I, like read, when I read it, I just, I just thought to myself, I did know a bit about her because I, I've done various Shaw plays over the years. And so having done a bit of background reading about Shaw, inevitably she came into that reading and I always thought she must have been a remarkable character. And then at one stage... Um, you probably know exactly who I mean by an actor who worked a lot with um, Dame Penelope, uh, an actor called Paul Eddington. And Paul was a walking treasure trove of theatrical history. It's very sad now that drama schools don't do any courses in theatrical history. I mean, a lot of younger people now don't even know who Laurence Olivier or John Gilgood is, let alone... Well, it's true. It really is true, and I think it's shocking that the drama schools don't do even a one-term course in our own British theatrical history. It's a terrible gap. Anyway, uh, Paul loved theatrical stories. Perhaps that's inevitable, because that generation grew up with almost exclusively a theatre background. They they grew up in a background of repertory theatre, which sadly is virtually lost uh, to us now, and lost to young actors, which is, I think, a terrible terrible uh, gap in the way young people can learn. You can only learn by getting it wrong. And uh, rep theatre was a great way of doing that. (laughs) Age 23, going on as a doddery 80-year-old. Anyway, um, Paul used to tell wonderful stories about uh, about actors. And uh, he had, as a young actor himself, he had worked at a very enterprising, in those days, Liverpool Playhouse which was run by a remarkable man, uh, a very soft-spoken Scotsman, much given to tears, uh, called Willie Armstrong. Well, he was called William Armstrong, but everybody called him William. And he was very sentimental uh, and didn't really direct, according to uh, Paul. He kind of nudged people into giving performances, which is no bad thing, actually. It's a perfectly possible way, viable way of directing, and sort of make them feel they're doing it themselves. And he sort of directed in the tea breaks um, <laughs> when he used to entertain them all with these stories of the theatrical greats he's worked. He was a great talent spotter, Willie. He found Deborah Carr, he found Robert Donat, he found Rex Harrison. I mean, I could go on, and that was just three of his discs. Michael Redgrave was another one. Uh, and um, he had worked, Willie had worked as a young actor before he became a director. And he used to delight Paul with these stories about when he played far too young. He played um, Tessman in Hedda Gabler, uh, Hedda Gabler's husband. And Mrs. Pat by then was in her 50s, was stout to say the least, and really wasn't natural casting any longer for Hedda. Uh, and Willie, he was 23 or something. <laughs> Must have looked absurd. Uh, but he said she was extraordinary. She made, after 10 minutes, he said, audiences just accepted her. She, such was her magnetism. And it was Paul who asked, well, was she a really great actress? And Willie said, yes, she was great. When she felt like it. <laughs> because there was this demon in her. She says herself, she was governed by demons and I, th- I think that was true largely because she was completely untrained um, she, be- she became remarkably uh, sophisticated culturally she read huge amounts she was a very talented musician uh, but her schooling was to say the least sporadic uh, as I say she didn't train for the stage but she was monkey quick she sort of picked things up like osmosis she was a great um, snapper up of other people's trifles uh, and her own instincts, I think, were very true. I never saw her act, of course, but from everything I've read about her and from everything I've heard down the lines, from people like Paul, who came down from Willie, so there is a kind of lineage there. I do feel that she was one of these rare creatures. I think today, maybe somebody like, um, to a certain extent, Penelope Keith or Maggie Smith, 
have something of the same quality, which is to inhabit a character entirely in the present tense on stage, which means they give you the ability uh, to believe that they're actually thinking and articulating that character's thoughts on that particular moment for that particular time and for that time only. It's probably the hardest thing to do. It's why I'm no actor. Uh, it's the hardest thing to do as an actor is to make sure that an audience think that the thoughts are coming from that particular brain. And I think she had that. And that's what I think she meant by sometimes the demons worked for her and sometimes they worked against her. I don't think it was a willful kicking of her talent over the goalposts uh, because she just couldn't be bothered or it was a dull audience. I think there were evenings occasionally when that happened. She used to refer to a thin house. She used to mutter to the actors on stage, oh dear, the Marquis and Marchioness of Empty are in again tonight. <laughs> but uh, I think that was on, only on rare occasions. But there were times when, you know, because she didn't perhaps have that rock-solid technique which you acquire through training, uh, and she didn't train, as I say. Uh, but I, th I, th I think there were nights when the divine, whatever it is, just didn't descend. And it was probably frustration that it wasn't coming through. You know, she wasn't being channeled with what she needed to hear to let the performance out, that occasionally she may have given a duff performance. I mean, uh, Willie Armstrong did say that when she was bad, she was very, 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 very bad. But when she was good, something happened. Something happened in a theatre that electrified an audience. Uh, and I, I do think that um, Penelope does do a remarkable job in recreating that volatility. I think you would agree with that. Yes, I haven't seen it be very, very, very bad yet. <laughs> wait, 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 all right. Wait, I hope she's not listening. She's listening, she's she's listening. listening. Yeah. she is listening. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really mean it. <laughs> now, does anybody have any questions for us? Another question, yes. Do we know why she was left so badly off at the end? Yes. In other words, how extravagant had she been? Oh, wildly. Wildly extravagant. Uh, if she had money, she spent it like a whole fleet of drunken sailors. But um, it also, it wasn't just on... She, she wasn't a selfish person. No, she's in that. very generous. She supported a lot of people. She supported a lot of people in her family, which obviously a lot of people d didn't know about. And also friends... Fellow actors fellow actors, all of these people, you know, and some were obviously sponging off her, and then, of course, there was the second marriage, that was a disaster. And her um, son. Her son. And her daughter, she supported debt. them. Yeah. So there was, there were, there was all of that. Yes. So it was a combination of finances and also the quarantine. Yeah. was really put paid to a lot I of I mean, it. the last ten years of her life were tricky financially. She did have a little flurry in Hollywood in the early 30s. And you'll, if you haven't seen the play, you'll, you'll see she rather buggered up her chances there by her, well, magnificent inability to conform. Uh, you know, she should have done what you have to do still in Hollywood. You have to know the right people and you have to say the right things and to go to the right parties and all that. And she was just constitutionally incapable of doing all that. So a Hollywood career never really took off. Although she did make one, if you ever get the chance to see it, uh, Crime and Punishment. So, yes, Joseph von Sternberg yeah. made a movie of Crime and Punishment, and she's not got a big part. She plays a rather venal old pawnbroker. Uh, Peter Lorre, no mean scene stealer himself, uh, but she doesn't let him walk away with it. It's, it's, it's a, not a big part, but she's very striking in it. And you get a glimpse, obviously, it doesn't tell you what she was like on stage. The discipline's totally different, but you do realise you're watching somebody rather special. But the reason I think she was so poor in the last decade was after Hollywood work dried up and she had one big Broadway success after that in 1933 in a play by Ivor Novella, which ran for quite a long time. It's where she met her final dog, Moonbeam. She just sort of... He was cast as her dog in the play, and the producers never saw him again. She just tucked him under her arm at the end of the run and walked off with him. Uh, but that was her last really big success. And as Anton says, she sort of didn't help herself by not really being available to work in the UK because she wouldn't come back and put Moonbeam in the quarantine for six months. She just wouldn't do it. So she became rather trapped in, in France with... Her only income really being a very nice monthly stipend that the Guinness family paid her. Some of her friends were very loyal. She alienated some and some just drifted away. And of course it was the war and things became even more difficult. But um, 
a friend of Scott Fitzgerald called Gerald Murphy and his wife Sarah uh, were very kind to her. Indeed, they paid for her funeral expenses. Uh, but also the Guinness family gave her, I think it was £100 a month as a kind of pension, which sounds nothing, but of course in 1939-40 was enough to pay for a modest room in a New York hotel uh, or a Paris hotel. But she'd always spent the £100 by the end of the month, so was always having to get credit and extend her terms. So she, she was both profligate... If she saw something she liked, like a set of beautiful tooled leather books, she would buy it in funds. Uh, and as Anton says, she was also very, very generous, and quite often anonymously so. You know, and a fellow actor down on his or her luck would find a £10 note in his or her pocket uh, when she didn't want it to be known. But she did try and get her... I mean, there's, there's references... Um, you know, that you can find that she was pretty much arrested, wasn't she, at customs, trying to get these dogs and whatever through, smuggling them in. Hat well, she was arrested. Well, she was arrested. She, she did go to bag. court. Yes, yes, for smuggling a dog in a hat box. <laughs> and the dog barked. So, I mean, she did try. Anything else? Yes. I'm fascinated to know what... I was fascinated by what you said about, about not having any theatrical history in drama schools. I so agree with you. And I was thinking, because I've seen the play that up to a certain age, there will be so many in the audiences who won't know the names that she's talking about. She mentions John Gielgud, whom she thinks might, might do quite well, well later on. I'm not sure the younger ones would know. But the younger yeah. ones, who's Max Beerbohm? You know, and I wonder whether yeah. they enjoy the play as much. Probably not. I think it helps to have some, at least some interest in the theatre of the past. Uh, I don't think it's absolutely, totally necessary. I think you could enjoy the play without that. But it does, I think, just give it a bit more resonance if you know some of the people she's talking about. Uh, I mean, George Alexander, uh, who was her employer in her first big success, I would have thought about one person in 2000, if that, yeah. would have heard of George Alexander. I think people, most people have heard of John Gilgood, I think, and most people have probably heard of Ellen Terry, if only as a name. And I think most people would have heard of Sarah Bernhardt, if only as a vaguely famous name from the theatrical past. But that, that's probably about it. But the whole actor-producer name not, you know, doesn't exist now. Does well, I don't know. It's coming back. Look at young Kenneth Branagh. <laughs> no? May I just say something about Anton's scripts? Yes. I thought that was really um, perfect because you had a mixture of humour and then there was a sadness yeah, and just the way you had written for um, it was just stunning. It was just thank you very perfect. much. Yes, I felt that when I first read it, although it's changed a bit since when yeah. I first read it, uh, I thought well, I really would not want to direct this woman, but I would like to meet her in the theatre. Because I do think she's an extraordinary personality. She says at one point, what exactly is it? To be in this profession, she's talking about being in the theatre. It's something I think very true still. Uh, oh, you know, yes. To be in this profession yeah. requires courage. And, and that sounds rather sentimental, and I don't mean it that way, but it does, you know, it really does. This place, this profession rather, is full of setbacks, and especially for actors. Uh, I think comparatively, directors have it fairly easy compared with actors. I mean, actors have to get used to constant rejection. Plays get put on and they don't work. It, it's, it, it's a very difficult business. Uh, I think that's why she admired Bernhardt so much, because Bernhardt was so astute at running her career as if it was a business. Yeah. I mean, she, she bought into the, the art of it, but she absolutely saw that she herself was a business, which everybody forgets these days, that you yourself are your business and you have to make money by yourself in some way and that's why everybody's got six or seven jobs because they work so sporadically and Mrs Pat didn't have that but Bernhardt absolutely understood that you really do have to absolutely, and yeah. it's not that you're greedy it's nothing like yeah. that but you have to support yourself yeah. I mean Bernhardt may have started at the Comédie Française but when she toured America she went into partnership with Barnum of Barnum and Bailey you know she knew which side the bread was buttered on can I ask I do agree with uh, Penelope Keith getting totally into the character because at times you forget it's Penelope Keith and you, you are thinking it's the actress. But how difficult is it as a director just directing 
one person as opposed to a whole cast? Well, it, it's odd. It's, it's very different. Uh, I've only ever done one previous solo show, and that wasn't quite solo. That was with Maureen Lippman playing Joyce Grenfell. Yes. Um, yes. But even, yes. even there, there was a pianist who occasionally strummed away while she nipped off in the wings to change a frock. So you know, she at least got a break. She could, if, if she'd just done one sketch and maybe it hadn't been quite as she planned, she had time to mentally regroup. Now, Penelope Keith doesn't get that luxury in this. It's relentless. You know, you just cannot stop concentrating for a moment. I mean, you shouldn't stop concentrating in a play, play with lots of other actors either, but... Occasionally, when the energy has to come from the other actor, you can slightly relax, but you, ca you can't in this. I mean, everything has to be focused in the moment. So the concentration required is huge. So one thing, just a purely technical thing, that was sort of necessary was to decide, that even before we started, that we wouldn't rehearse each day for terribly long. I mean, normally you rehearse from 10 till 5, 10 to 6 maybe, with an hour's break. Uh, what we did with this was to rehearse from 11 to about 4, 4.30, but with no real lunch break, for about half an hour at the most, just time for a sandwich and an apple or something. Uh, any longer than that, and the actor's brain, and I would also have to say the director, especially a rather elderly director now, uh, the brain gets a little bit fried, and you... I don't know about the writer, I never asked you this, um, but you were in there for a long time. I mean, did you feel occasionally at the end of the day that your brain was getting a little bit... No, it was, ju it was just strange revisiting something, actually, from such a long time ago, although we'd worked on it. Um, no, it was a pleasure. And I, you know, you learn. This is what's so interesting about saying about you know, learning theatre history. I mean, I went to drama school, but actually I probably learnt more just sitting in the wings. I mean, I worked here 20 years ago for about three seasons, and you see amazing stuff going on. So you do learn by observation, and you hear stories. I mean, we moan all the time about the mobile phone, don't we, in rehearsal, and people shouldn't use it because you stop talking. You actually stop interacting with the other people, and then you stop hearing the stories that make you laugh or that interest you. Um, so in terms of the rehearsal, um, no, it was hugely enjoyable, but I, I, I did learn a lot. Good. Um, like to hear that from an author? But yes, no. Well, we'd worked together before. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate because I've got, a, well, my favourite director. Oh, bless. And a favourite well, actress. Well, you're the only one else. that's asked me to do something else, so you've got to be. Um, but yes, in a favourite actress... You know, it's terrific. So, and in a favourite space. Yeah. But it is to answer your question. It is different doing yeah. a play with just just one actor. The energy in the room is different. The, the protocol is different. Giving notes is very difficult. I mean, normally, after run-throughs and dress rehearsals and all that, you you stop and at the end of the run-through or the dress rehearsal or whatever it is, you stop and you've got your notes and, and you give them to, to the actors. Well, giving notes to a cast of actors is one thing, but giving notes to just one actor, mm. you have to... I, well, the first time we did it after a run-through, I realised I've got to stop. This is ridiculous. I mean, the poor woman, she can't take all this in. It's too much. Uh, so you have to ration them. You have to sort of edit them. You just have to adjust to the different discipline. But it is a very different discipline, certainly. But you'd worked together before. We had worked together before several yes. times, which, which, which helps. Yeah. It's a kind of shortcut. Uh, but I still, as I say, in these early run-throughs, I had to keep reminding myself not to give too many notes. I mean, when you've got a company, you know, maybe there's five notes for each actor. That's fine. Uh, you know, but one actor getting, say, 30 notes, it's an awful lot at the next run-through to remember, oh, God, he said that, oh, he said that. And in the end, you end up playing the notes and not playing the performance. It's, 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 it's something that's got to be always kept in mind. I figured it would be different. I just wondered if it was more difficult. No, it's not more difficult. Not once you remember that. No, it's not. And it's great fun. I mean, I, I really had... We've had... It sounds silly, maybe, in a way, because the play isn't an out-and-out -out laugh a minute. There's laughs in it, but it's... It, but we had a lot of laughs doing it. I think that's awfully important. <laughs> I quite self. miss it, actually. I, I mean, if you can't... Rehearsal, you've, or... you've got to relax. I mean, the, re the rehearsals are very hard. Yeah. But if they can't be... Fun, as well as hard. I can't remember who said it. It was either Terence Rattigan or Noel Coward. It was one of the two uh, who said, um, work is more fun than fun. Um, 
And I think that's true of, of rehearsals. If you haven't had a good time, there's usually something wrong. I mean, I don't mean that in any self-indulgent way. Just, it's, it's just got to be enjoyable to do. Otherwise, what are we doing it for? You know, and the audience have got to enjoy it as well. And I think that's true even if you're doing Strindberg. In fact, probably even all the more so if you're doing Strindberg. <laughs> You've got to have a good time in rehearsals. I mean, I don't mean you have to stand there making jokes all day, but just make the atmosphere quite easy. I wondered why um, Anton was so intrigued with Mrs. P- about Mrs. Pat um, or Mrs. Patrick Campbell that he went on to actually investigate more, which made him feel, feel he could write a play. What? How Sorry, he was what? so intrigued about oh, the story, um, about her story. I suppose because she made me laugh, because she was so rude. I think that's what, what really hooked me in. Yes, there were lots of, lots of stories, and then you just naturally want to read round it. I mean, it's just unfortunate that there isn't more footage of her, and the films you know, aren't particularly, you know, they're not great apart from the last one. But it, it was that, and I don't know, I suppose I wanted to write, and I just thought it was an interesting subject, and it hadn't really been... Done. I wanted her to take her out of the shore shadow and just focus on her. And I thought, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, I thought it was interesting that she'd become an actress manager, that she was a, a female um, at that time running her own business. And the, the whole sense that somebody can almost start at the top, be an overnight sensation, which she really was. Oh, yes, in the days when it was possible, but before television yeah. and films, before it was, it was possible to be a star overnight, yes. and, and, and she, like Irving was, uh, when he did The Bells. And it's certainly true of her. The first night of the second Mrs. Tankery was genuinely, and this is no exaggeration, it was a legendary first night. It was the talk of London for the next six months. I mean, it, I mean, there's a, is it one of Hilaire Belloc's things? He went to see that interesting play, the second Mrs. Tanqueray. Oh, that's uh, right, yes. Yeah. And it was, it was a sensation. But uh, how you can go from that to that. And that was a big learning curve. I did think, writing it, I can't end up on a platform with a dog or a cat or something. I've got to, you know, maybe put some money aside. <laughs> yeah. And who was responsible for the settings? I think it's one oh. of the best settings I've ever seen. Good. In Minerva. That was a, a designer I've, I've worked with before who's very um, used to working here. In fact, he's an associate, I think he's what they call an associate director here uh, with a particular category of design associate. He's called Simon Higlett, and he's designed masses of play. Oddly enough, he's only done this this season he's been very busy on other things but normally he does probably two or three in the big house and maybe one in the Minerva as well Uh, and I've worked with him a few times and for me when I read this play and certainly when I knew we'd be doing it in this space which I've not worked in before I've done in the big house but I haven't worked on this stage before although I love it I've seen lots of plays here Um, and I thought well I've not worked here before so it would make sense to have a designer who knows how to control the space, especially with only one actor, you know, you, it makes its demands, you have to have various areas to sit so that you favour you don't ignore any of the sides, so as soon as I knew it was coming here, I got in touch with Simon and by some miracle he was just, his dates between one show beforehand and one show just after, they just fitted and uh, he was able to do it and I think he's done a lot, and I was able to get another regular colleague, uh, Jason Taylor, who, who did the lighting, which I also think is terrific, uh, and he was free, and the sound boy I've worked with before was free. It was a show I've, on which I really, although oddly, I've worked with everybody before. I've worked with you, worked yes. with Penny, and worked with all the technical crew. Uh, I don't know why it was like that. I just, maybe I just felt, well, anyway, I just knew they were all right for the jobs. And, uh, <laughs> And I think my choices were right. I mean, they, they've done, I think they've done the play very, very proud, because it's just her for one evening. So the the surroundings have to contain both the play and the performer, without crushing either. And I, for my money, that they all designer, lighting designer, video designer, um, uh, sound man, uh, they've all come up trumps in that regard, definitely. Just going back to the rehearsal process again, um, knowing how difficult it is as you get older to learn lines, it gets more and more and more difficult. Did she come to the first day already pretty well knowing them? Um, 
No, she, uh, she held the book for a few days. Uh, she'd had the script for quite a long time. Uh, several months, I think. Can't Although really remember. We were working on it. There and there were, were, but there were changes. So I think until the text was fairly firm, although she understood that there might be the odd change here and there in rehearsal. Indeed, some were, there were some changes in rehearsal, and some were her suggestions, some were mine, some were Anton's. Uh, but her memory is extraordinary, I and mean, she's got a, an ability to get under the skin of a character fairly quickly. Uh, so I think the book was down within a week. I, I mean, it was, a, it was amazing at the speed that we... You know, because you, you don't know how... I mean, I know how you work... Um, but sometimes you can be in a rehearsal and say, oh, Christ, you know, here we are, we're bouncing balls or we're being teapots or something. And it was I wouldn't amazing try it, that well, no, with Dame Penelope no, Keaton. No. no, I'm sure. But no, she wouldn't be very keen on being a teapot for the no, afternoon. I'm sure. I've done it with some other actors. But the they weren't keen either. With which we worked. Well, yes. But the speed with which we worked, I thought, was amazing. And I loved that about it. Well, my feeling with this one... I mean, every play is different. My feeling on this one was... Well, we only had three weeks, which actually was long enough, I think, f- and then we didn't have to preview till the Thursday of the following week. So the schedule was, a f- was fine. I have no quarrels with that at all. I just felt because of the discipline demanded of the actor, it was probably better, even if things were wrong, we could always change them later, but at least to find a physical pattern for the play. I don't do it... When I was young, it was a very long time ago, I used to spend hours we all do this, sitting in front of the model of the set and have little men made out of pipe cleaners and move them there, move them there, move them there. And it's, it's like being, you know, one of these war game things when you push people about uh, so that you, you wouldn't be found wanting in rehearsal, you'd be able to say. And I, go, I, mean, I started nearly a half a century ago. So, you know, you can say, no, you move there, you move there, you move there. And the first play I did... I thought, well, why are they not moving where my pipe cleaner did? <laughs> and it was a waste of time. It was a complete waste of time. Uh, because, you know, human bodies aren't pipe cleaners. So ever since then, I've never, ever... I do read a play very, very often and carefully before we start, but I've made it a rule ever since then never to stage a play in advance because the actors' bodies will do things that you can't predict until they're up there. So I didn't have a, you know, I didn't know that she would necessarily sit on that trunk on that line or sit on that bench on that line. All I knew was that given the space here, you can't just have an actor sitting here all night. It's going to be deeply boring and a lot of people will not be able to engage with the evening. So we, I staged it pretty quickly, but then I, having worked with Penelope Keith before, uh, I know she likes to work quite quickly as well, at least just to you know, get the pattern, feel the stage, feel the boards underneath her feet. And, you know, quite often later on, when you start doing longer sections, the actor will say, well, I don't think I need to do that move, or I don't need to sit here. I can... And then you accommodate. Um, so we, d- we, did, we did work quite quickly in that regard, the, f- the physical staging. It was, it was actually on its feet the entire play by the end of the first week, I think, wasn't it? Yes, but it, but it sort of had to be. Really. You haven't given any credit yet to the French station. Ah, uh, well, you can thank him personally brilliant. yourself. He's called Emmanuel, and he's one of the security people at the theatre. <laughs> exactly. And he perfect. comes from the Ivory Coast, and of course, French was his first language. And uh, he did all the recordings of that, and he's terrific. He's, he's great. He was a bonus. We, I didn't know he was here. I thought we'd have to. He's here today. I've just said hello to him. Oh, he's like, so he was doing the afternoon yeah. show, yeah. yeah. Well, he's doing the evening yeah. show as well. He was terrific. He was one take, Emmanuel. He was, he was, he was very popular. <laughs> Can I ask a question to Anton about writing? When you're writing a, a play, particularly a monologue, and as you're getting to know the character that you're writing about, do you have an actor or an actress in mind who you would like to take part? Not really. I did it once. I did, I did write something for somebody who did it, and I did sit there in the audience saying, or at least in terms of me, that I was absolutely right, and I thought she was remarkable, and she did get very good reviews. But no, normally you don't, because it's, 
you sort of have a have an idea of who would be in the casting bracket and who you would hope for. And I mean, this has been a dream come true. Um, but you never, not really, no. I mean, you, you, you sort of might have physical ideas about you know somebody about sort of shapes that people might make on stage or whatever in your in your mind you might have a dream cast but um not no not really now I it's hard because i knew a little bit about is it patrick campbell yeah. i grew up with knowing that who she was and, yes. uh, and that she'd had this association with uh, george bernard shaw when, it, when i was a, a, a child i knew that but when i saw this in the casting i thought Absolutely ideal. Uh, I thought Penny Keith is just going to be brilliant in it. Yes. It's almost yeah. as if I had a, some sort of image. I can't describe what the image art was of Mrs. Patrick Campbell. But in research before coming to see this, I've looked up on the internet and looked at photographs and think cause she's just as I imagined her. Yeah. And somehow I, I think, uh, so I'm really looking forward to this evening. I had a strong feeling when I first read it that the first person to go to, this doesn't always happen, no. uh, was Penelope, and was delighted, of course, when she said yes. And I think the reason why it's such a good match, well, there are various things. I mean, she's more or less the same age as Mrs. Patrick Campbell was when the play set in 1940, although a lot of it looks back in time, but physically it's set in 1940. And oh, this sounds difficult to actually express this but there's something about the quality of mind that Mrs Patrick Campbell had which I think matches something in the actress which is to do with a commitment to what being in the theatre is all about uh, again it's very difficult to say this without sounding sentimental it's a sort of moral quality you've either got it or you haven't uh, nothing to do with star quality it's not the same thing as that at all it's to do with the fact that this person is an actor not for fame not for glory I always find it interesting to think of why an actor does it in the context of what Nina in The Seagull says over the road uh, when she talks about realising at last when she comes back in the last act very changed. Life has treated her not at all well in the two years between the third act and the fourth act of The Seagull. And she talks about the fact that um, she now knows that being in the theatre, or being a writer, I think she says to Constantine, being in our professions has nothing to do with fame, it has nothing to do with glory, it's to do with hard work and knowing what you are trying to do. And I think that's very true. I mean, perspiration that undercuts and underpins performances is huge. And it comes from experience. It comes from a commitment to what being on a stage is all about. And one of the reasons I admire this performance such a lot, it's the old cliche, I just feel that every drama student should see this because it, it looks relatively effortless, but it's not. I mean, I... I don't want to be ungallant. I don't know how many years uh, Penelope Keith has been in the theatre, but it's quite a few. And one of the things that she can bring, and one of the reasons I had to have an, an actor of that calibre, is the technical abilities. I mean, it's, some of it's very, very basic. It's things like breath control. It's the thing about being able to say a sentence, a long sentence, in sometimes Edwardian phrases, without pausing in between and having to snatch a breath. It's to do with how to turn the body. It's to do how to stress a particular line so that every word makes absolute sense without overponging any particular syllable. And, you know, I would just love students to see that, and just to, to, uh, but also to realise that what underpins an apparently seamless, swimming-through-silk kind of performance is actually based on hard graft underneath. And that's what you do for the three weeks. You do, and some of it is just repeating it and repeating it and repeating it until it's right. Uh, so I, I, I think that's one of the reasons I thought of her for this play, amongst others, was the fact that I knew she'd bring something more than just a good performance. She'd bring something extra to it. And I think she has. Would Penelope Keith, Penelope Keith not agree to be made to look stouter, like Michael Ball in Mac and Mabel? Because you keep in the play it referred to her being stouter, but she's well, so slender. Uh, it went up. She went up and down like a yo-yo. 
Uh, I mean, she would diet for a bit and then she'd forget to. And, but towards the end of her life, she actually didn't have that much money, so she wasn't able. She does say eclairs will be less expensive. But I think the chocolate eclairs were a once-a-week treat rather than a once-a-day treat in those days. So she's not pa- uh, we didn't want her to be padded because wearing padding is a nightmare. You can't breathe properly. It's, apart from anything else, it's very sweaty. Mm. Uh, and fine if you're just coming on for the odd scene here and there, but for a whole evening, it would be technically, I think, impossible. And it's not so much about doing an impersonation yeah. of somebody. It's, it's not. I think the costume, bad. which is deliberately designed loose, does create an impression of size, if not vast bulk. But as I say, her weight went up and down and fluctuated enormously in the last ten years. It was one of the things I was very struck by was the the rhythm that she had through this and and the up and the down. It was absolutely amazing bit of technical acting as yes. well as the feeling. I agree, and I think it's also a tribute to the writing, which I think yes. captures a lot of the cadence, if you like, and the rhythm of Edwardian prose. I mean, the sentences are longer, or tend to be, longer than we would use today. There are more qualifying clauses, um, there are more sentences that have in parentheses remarks, and it's, it's not a modern idiom. So you need somebody who knows how to phrase that and how to shape it. Is the play just here, or is it going to... At the moment, we don't know. Um, the, the, we, just, we all felt it would be lovely to get it on, have a look at it, because you never know. You never, that's the great thing about this business. You don't have a clue until you actually get it in front of people. Uh, you have an instinct, and you sense whether you like it or not, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody else is going to. And um, So we've just, it's on here for its four weeks, and it's here. If other people want to come and see it and have a look, we'll... We'll, we'll, we'll see. I would like it if it did have a would future Would you be life. sad if it was in a proscenium stage? Uh, no, not, not sad. Uh, <laughs> I think it would work. Um, I'd have to restage it quite a lot. But, I, you know, I, I'm very pragmatic about staging. I love working on theatre in the round. I love working in this space. I love working in the main house. I prefer non-proscenium theatres myself. But, you know, my bread and butter has been in the West End with proscenium art shows. And I, they're fine. I just find this kind of theatre much more resonant. I, fi- I, I find theatres like the West End theatres that... I never used to think this. Uh, but theatres are divided into four layers, you know, tiers. I find them now rather antisocial. <laughs> Where my my favourite theatre in all the world, which is where I got my theatrical, cut my theatrical teeth, I suppose, uh, was the Old Mermaid uh, in London, the old one before they changed it, uh, which wasn't had, didn't have people on different sides, but the, it was very democratic. There were 500 seats and a single uninterrupted layer that wasn't divided into stalls and circle, and the stage was a low stage like this. And that theatre had perfect acoustics, it had perfect sight lines, it could do anything from Brecht to musicals to J.B. Priestley, and did all those plays. And I loved that. It was just the right size, 500. And I love this space as well. I think uh, this is very actor-friendly and it's very audience-friendly. Uh, but if this had to play, say, I don't know, a relatively middle-sized proscenium house, I think it would work just as well. It would be slightly different, that's all. Yes. No, I must say, I just see it here because it makes like a, more of a dance. <clears throat> yes, no, I understand what you're saying. I would, it would be a big restaging job, but it could, it could be done. Anybody else? The more I've watched um, theatre, um, actors and actresses must be very fit. But seeing Penelope Keith's performance today, I didn't expect to see her now because I thought there's no way even a young actor could do wow. two performances and I take my hat off to her because how she remembers the lines when I can't even remember what I've gone upstairs for <laughs> is just incredible yeah well she's you know I, I keep coming back to this about pe- theatre animals you know th- and most people of Penelope's generation in the theatre were theatre animals they were bred in the theatre you know, they were doing weekly rep or fortnightly rep 
for a year at a time, playing a different part every fortnight. You know, they've earned their spurs, to put it mildly. Uh, and she's also very fit. She keeps herself extremely fit. I keep meaning, I haven't done it yet, but I keep asking, well, I keep meaning to ask the stage management. Well, actually, she couldn't do it because she shows her ankles at one point, but I'd love to put a pedometer on her. Oh, I <laughs> so that we could just work out how far she travels. She spends a lot of time on the move in this. It's, technically, it is a huge, huge ask, and I think she's risen to all the challenges and then some. God. As it was written 13 years ago, whose was the bright idea to suddenly drag it out? <laughs> well, it must have been yours, because you sent it to me. <laughs> I'm to blame. <laughs> Anton sent it to me not long after we'd done that previous play I mentioned. Yeah. And I liked it, with some reservations. And he, but, you know, he did admit, he said, this may need some work, because I haven't looked at it for a very long time. And so I think before Penelope saw it, we, you did change... No, we worked on it. I just didn't think there... I didn't know of another um, director that would really be suitable for it because your knowledge is so expansive about theatre history, British theatre history. Um, and I, I thought you would be interested in it, but I didn't know anybody else that would be right for it. Thanks and a I was Right. <laughs> yeah. I only got the job because I was the only one you could you think were the of. Only one. <laughs> Great. Anyway, we worked on it for, for quite a bit. Yeah. I felt that one thing that was in it that just needed pulling out a little bit more. Uh, it was there. It was certainly in the script. It just needed a wee bit of expansion. Was her position in a very male-dominated world, the world of the actor manager. Because I, prob I think one of the reasons she became so tricky to handle was that she must have, and perfectly understandably, must have resented the fact that she was much more intelligent. I don't mean in an intellectual sense, just more theatrically intelligent. Her instincts were more interesting and usually truer to the character and to the play than those of people like George Alexander, who the actor-manager, or Herbert Beerbohm Tree, who played Higgins to her Eliza and Pygmalion. Both very successful men, but both very conventional men, and both very determined that they, and, you know, they were the theatre owners and the managers, but they, con they called the shots, basically. And women were a second-class citizen uh, and treated as such, paid much less, uh, Mrs. Patrick Campbell made sure she got her pound of flesh when she came to do Pygmalion, but she still wasn't paid as much as Tree. Uh, so I think they resented her because she had the temerity to speak up for what she believed in. And I think one of the reasons that they found her so frustrating was that deep down they knew that on most occasions she was right, which must have been very frustrating for them. So that was that strain in the play, that the fact that she... I have a theory that if she was born today, or had been born a few years ago or whatever, in about ten years' time she'd be running the National Theatre. Uh, but in those days, in that society, it was just a non-starter. I mean, even for her to become briefly an actress manager was very, very unusual and hugely resented. People, didn't, the theatre community didn't like it. It wasn't what should be done. Sorry? So look at Lillian Bayliss. Yes. Yes. Not easy for her. Not at all. No. Right. So, thank you very much. You've got to stop. Thank you.